Thank you very much. Okay, so my name is Jesper. A uh, very brief introduction. I'll be working with. Uh, I've been working with Agile and Lean for the past 12 years now. Uh, my focus has always been core and the Lean Agile principles. And I love Scrum, elements of safe, all that stuff. But I'm very happy about the core elements of what we're really trying to strive for. For me, Toyota Kata has been one way of trying to generate, to leverage all the energy we have in the organization towards that goal. And making it specific enough so we can actually engage in the process of uh, moving towards a, a more shared direction. So I've been working with startups, just trying to get a product out of the runway uh, before you run out of money. Uh, large organizations, and naturally what we can sometimes do in a few days in the smaller organization, it, will might, it might take weeks or even months to do in the, in the larger setup. But it doesn't really matter from a CATA perspective, because as I hope you'll find out today, from a CATA perspective, it's about taking small steps in at a meaningful direction every single day. So, what I hope to share with you today is uh, some of the journey I've been through the last six years working with CATA. Hopefully that you'll take at least some pieces of this back home, use it for real in your own life. Uh, and anyway, use it for inspiration and maybe as a different way of looking on continuous improvement. I'm still, I'm confident that we have only been scratching the surface of true organizational continuous improvement so far in the, in the community. So what happens out there sometimes? Well, it's like improvement. It's not really invited to the real party. So there's all these great deadlines and user stories, and we're doing all we can to deliver on those. And then, yeah, improvement comes in late, and everybody is already tired, or the party is pretty much over, and there's a beer left in the corner, or at least half a beer, and that's what you get to drink. Uh, and that's like the organizational improvement focus that we actually managed to leverage uh, and that's such a shame because all the deadlines, all the user stories, that's the short term, that's our current capabilities. But improvement, that's going to make us competitive for tomorrow. That's going to make us better than the rest of the world. That's going to make sure that our products will be delivered faster with better feedback and better solutions to our end customers. So when I started reading about Toyota Kata, and it's all based on the work of Mike Rother and his team studying the real continuous improvement engine at Toyota. Uh, what struck me, and, uh, among a number of things, was this sentence. So, if you look at process improvement as something that you do on a bi-weekly, on bi-monthly basis, and you wake up to this workshop format where you focus on what has been working well and not so well, and you set out to do some smart goals going forward, that's not continuous improvement. You're setting yourself up for business as usual. If you're looking at a process that improves once every two weeks, you'll be looking at a process that is ideally set up to stick to the status quo. So if we want improvement to be part of the culture, then we need to make it something that we do on a daily basis. But that's not easy, because as you all know, we have the deadlines. We have all the nice user stories. Any of you familiar with the concept of four disciplines of execution? No, not long. Read that book, it's a brilliant one. Uh, they use this concept of the daily whirlwind. The daily whirlwind is all the usual stuff that we have to do. It's the defects that comes in from production, the user stories that we need to deliver, uh, the deadlines that we need to keep. And if we don't do anything, if we don't push against this daily whirlwind, it's going to make it very difficult for us as an organization and as a team to make room for continuous if improvement. And it doesn't come naturally. We have to actually do something to create that room. But it's also about the ambition level. We have a tendency to look very narrowly at what have been going well and not so well in the past two weeks or the past month. And when we look at things from such a narrow perspective, we tend to set goals that are not that ambitious. It's not going to be about how can we deliver a lot better than we're doing today. What if we got rid of all the nasty administrative work, all the processes that are not really helping us? What if we tended to set the bar higher and aim for a more ambitious direction? What then would happen? What kind of discussions would we have if we wanted to get there? And I think we need to be honest with, us, with ourselves. The process of continuous improvement is not something that comes natural at least to most organizations. It's not part of the organizational focus. It's not what we do every day. It's something that stresses our brain. And we need to be able to cope with that stress in a different way than just saying, I'm not going to deal with it at all. And that you, what you'll find is your brain, as we've heard many talks in the past days, eh? your brain is very, very, very against doing extra work. 
So whenever you get the chance, you'll avoid it. And it's the same with process improvement. It's much, much easier to just do things in the same way you've been doing for the past year. Your brain will like that. It's status, uh, it's status quo. I, like, I know the way we're working right now. If I can just keep working like that, you won't stress me. And I'm happy not to be stressed. But it's even worse. We have a tendency to look much more at our problems than our future direction. So we're looking at this from a, you can always hear the term retrospective. We're looking back. What went well? What did not go? But what if the whole process is dysfunctional? What if our entire feedback loop is not working as it should? Then you can problem solve all you want on your current process. It's not going to make you go any further. One of the examples of this. So organizations, they like big stuff, right? Oh, my God, I have a big program. So nice. If I can do safe, brilliant. Then I'm doing what the other guys are doing next door, and I can be happy too. The problem is that sometimes we forget that safe is trying to solve the problem. A lot of teams trying to coordinate their work towards a shared product. But what if they don't have a shared product? What if you don't need to have all that extra coordination and overhead? Then we should try to do everything we possibly can to avoid it. A few weeks ago, I was contacted. Yes, but do we have time for an engagement? Yeah, I might have some time over, some time left. Uh, yeah, it's a safe thing. Okay, okay, so how big is it? Oh yeah, get this, it's up to 10 people. Okay, okay. So if you're even remotely considering using safe in a setup where you have 10 people trying to coordinate, coordinate their work, I think something is seriously, seriously wrong with how we're trying to do this. Then we're not... We're a far cry away from the agile notion of simplicity, the, the art of maximizing the work not done right. But don't take my word for it. Directed improvement is so much more effective. You can find the studies in psycholo psychology, uh, NLP. They all say, our brain is so much better at working towards a desirable end state than it is at problem solving on our initial situation. All that's doing is anchoring ourselves in our current state. Socrates said this exact same thing. If you want to leverage your improvement potential, you need to work towards a desirable end state. You shouldn't start problem solving before you know where you want to go. And yet, what are we doing time and time again? Lots of impediment backlogs, even escalation impediment procedures, so that we make sure that all our problems that we might not even want to fix, they go to the very top of the organization where they can do nothing about it. Okay. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, showing a cute animal slide at one point in your presentation is going to make you enjoy this much more. So you'll give me a 15% better review just by me showing this slide. So I'm just going to say thank you and leave it at that. Okay, so let's try to look at what Toyota Cat is and how we might use it in our daily life to do things in a smarter way. First thing you need to recognize is that from a Toyota perspective, your competitive advantage comes not from what you can do today, but how much faster you can improve compared to the people around you. And that's why for years they've been inviting people into their factories saying, okay, yeah, our biggest competitor in the American market, come, we'll gladly show all of what we're doing in our factory. And then they'll go back and they'll spend two years trying to copy the exact procedures and practices they've been establishing. And so it'll be like, yeah, but why are you trying to use our solutions for our situations in your context, which is drastically different? And then they'll come back two years after and they'll be very disappointed because Toyota had the nerve to do something very different in that period because now they've improved and they'll say, yeah, but we just spent two years copying your existing setup, and now you have a new, new setup. Should we then use two years to try to do that as well? Probably not. Probably you should find out what direction you want to move in and then make the systematic steps in that direction. Okay, so the one word is Toyota. That's about the car manufacturer we all know. The other word, word is Kata. And Kata, how many of you have been doing martial arts at some point? So you're probably all familiar with this series of movements that you're doing again and again and again to try to build what we call muscle memory. And that's because if you stand in a sparring fight and a person is trying to hit you or kick you, then if you have to consciously evaluate, okay, he's moving his right foot, that's probably going to turn into this kind of kick. I should probably move in this direction and then I should do a counterattack looking like this. And by the time your brain gets through that cyclist, you're already lying on the floor in pain. 
Uh, but it's much the same thing with improvement. If we want to make this a natural part of our daily work, that doesn't stress our brain, but it feels natural, and it's just part of whatever we do, as much as part of what we do as, bu as building the next user story or uh, handling the next operation and maintenance issue, then we need to build it in as a natural, continuous part of how we work. So what we've been aiming for is trying to find out how can we use these principles in a different setup. Because it is different. Uh, we're not working with a cycle time of minutes or seconds in the Agile world. So when we look at a manufacturing process, it looks pretty easy because you can set up an experiment, you can measure probably just in two minutes, was that experiment successful or not? And then you can evaluate based on that, what should be our next step in that direction? And you might even have the, uh, the goal of making 100,000 pieces that are exactly the same, meaning that the variability involved is very, very low. So the accuracy of our mesh measurements and metrics are going to be pretty great. So can we take the principles, the ground principles, and turn them into our environment while successful? That's a big question. That's what we've been trying to to find out. There's also another notion of what does a value stream look like? So we all talk about value stream, but in my sense is that few people are actually aware of the fact that in an agile world, we're trying to redefine the notion of a system. So the ideal thing in an agile world is that if a single team can identify what they want to build, they can implement it, they can validate and test, and they can put it into production. That is the ultimate state. That's where we want to get to as much as possible. And we want to actually avoid this tendency for one team to deliver to the next team, to the next team, to the next team. And then finally, we manage to produce some end user value. Right? So that's a different notion. And that meaning, and meaning that when you try to coach, then you have the luxury in an agile world to coach a single team, and then you can actually create some improvement value. While if you optimize for a team that's not the bottleneck in the bottom there, then you might just increase the bottleneck even further, right? So we shouldn't address something that's not the bottleneck. So how do we do that? First, we need to understand that Toyota Kata is about directed improvement, and that means we need to know where we're going. Uh, that's what we call the vision. In Toyota, it's called one-by-one one flow at lowest possible cost to the end user. Uh, but what is the agile notion of this one-by-one one flow thing? Uh, what is the actual direction that we're trying to move in? And the problem is that for years we were looking at the Agile Manifesto, and it was all great and nice, but people had a lot of trouble turning that into specific results. So what did they do instead? They grabbed hold of Scrum, they grabbed hold of Safe, they grabbed hold of other methods that were more prescriptive in the way you should work, because those principles were too abstract, too vague for people to actually work with. So we need to find out what does our Agile vision mean. And if for your company, your Agile vision includes the entire company working in a safe setup, then actually you can do that. It's not that I would recommend it, because you'll probably be introducing a lot of overhead in situations where you shouldn't, because it's, it should be limited to the situation where you're doing with scaled Agile. But you could do that, but you need to know where you're going. The challenge in a CATA context, we found out that for development, a two to six months challenge is typically something that works very well. So that's the goal of bringing our process to this state within. It could be a continuous delivery setup, or at least part of a continuous delivery setup. That's where we want to be in two months. And I'll get into a bit more details about how we can track that measure. But two to six months is still pretty far away. So we set a target condition. And a target condition in an agile setup, we found that is typically a good, a four weeks time span is typically a good way of doing it. So it it's allows us to set goals that are pretty ambitious, but they're still close enough for, uh, for them to be relevant. The great thing about CADA is that we always do this from our current condition. And that means that suddenly our dirty laundry, it's not a problem hanging out there for everybody to see because that just means we have much more improvement potential. So the fact that 0% of our user st stories right now are written from a true outside-in perspective because they all say, as a team member, I want this, or as a product owner, I want this, or whatever uh, things that we know we shouldn't do, but we tend to do anyway. That just means that we can improve endlessly from a percentage perspective anyway. So the fact that the team next door, they're already at 70%, well, they don't have the pr improvement potential we do, because we're starting at zero. Great. So imagine an organization where you could go to the organization, and at every layer, Every manager, every team, you could ask them these questions and you would actually get a clear answer. What are you trying to achieve? What goal are you actually moving towards? Where are you now? Real? Based on real data? 
uh, what obstacles are in your way? What is actually keeping you from reaching this tight condition? And it's drastically different asking about obstacles from trying to move towards a desired future state than just asking for any kind of problem you could solve in your current work. What is your next step? And what do you expect? And important, when can you go and see what you've learned from taking that step? So that's the process of continuous improvement that we want to build into our daily lives. So when we're working towards a true north, we're going from what can we improve? And for any given team, even in the most mature organization, you could come up with a hundred things that could improve. But that's not really important. The important question is, if we want to get here, what are the very, very few things we should focus on right now? And let's ignore all of the noise around us. Because fixing all of those 100 or 200 problems is probably not going to move us anywhere at all. So problem solving, just fixing problems for the sake of fixing problems, is not the way to do continuous improvement. So if you learn anything from today, remember just fixing problems is not a way to do continuous improvement. Okay. So I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but these are some of the headlines that we chose to include in the Agile vision. So where do we actually want to go? Uh, what does it mean to be at a better place than we are right now? What is the ideal thing from an Agile perspective? And it's something to do with ma managing actually to safely delegate decision responsibilities to the team level. It's about continuous delivery practices where we don't batch from a technical perspective either. And once we have that direction, then we can turn our organizational energy in towards moving closer to it. And we can do it at all organizational levels, meaning that we can actually engage managers also in the process of safely delegating decision responsibility to the team level. And if the team is very immature, they probably can't do it right now, but we want to get to the place where we trust them to be able to take on this responsibility and work uh, so we can avoid all these hierarchies and information going up and down, because that's very expensive. So, you might think of it like this, and don't try to read all the details in this slide, that's really not the purpose of it. You can look at it afterwards when you get it. That we have some core agile lean capabilities that we're striving for. Those are the ones in the middle. To, we have the, the great assumption that if we can deliver on those, we will deliver on our business goals down here. Instead of dragging in Scrum, Lean Startup, Lean UX, Safe, whatever, as the goal, we're using all those great tools as an inspiration catalog to support our direction. This is where we really want to be. Great, we can use a product owner because a product owner might help us delegate decision responsibility to the team level. Excellent, but now we're suddenly thinking about a product owner from a different perspective than just this person is always doing everything wrong and they're not serving a perfect line of user stories for us to work on so we don't have to communicate with the outside world. And then we have Kata. Kata is the engine of trying to continuously get us closer to this state. And now there's something, some might not consider this very agile, but it's very, very effective. Setting measurable improvement goals. We always hear the terms, yeah, agile is a mindset. You cannot really put it into a box. Uh, but the thing is, people are going to do that anyway. We've seen that with Safe, Scrum, even Kanban, who was originally principle-based, turned, in, turned into being just a set of practices that people were trying to follow. So people are going to do it anyway. So why not make that focus on our core lean agile direction instead of the specific roles and practices? It's also the basis of scientific thinking. So if we can validate whether we are taking effective steps in our direction, then we can validate when things go wrong too. Because the thing is that it's not a straight road from A to B plus improvement. It's as much an iterative exercise as product development is. But if we can suddenly take steps to measure, okay, so we did this great experiment. Did that move us to a state where we have a higher degree of outside-in focus on our user stories? So it might be things like from 10 to 1 expedites per week. That sounds kind of nice because all these expedites, all these things that need to be solved right now that we cannot delay, uh, they're kind of stressing our team. Or it might be that we have one from one to six periods of uninterrupted work. Oh, that's great too, right? Because all these meetings and constant change of priorities, uh, it really stresses us and makes a task switch all the time. 
It might be that we're great at setting whip limits, but we're terrible at actually sticking to those work in progress limits. So what about getting some data saying, okay, right now we're actually doing that 15 times. What if we could get that down to a lower number? That would move us one step closer to the direction we're trying to get to. And I know that some of you are sitting out there now saying, okay, met more metrics. Oh my God, is that what Agile has come to? But I can only say, if those metrics are valuable to you, if you believe that delivering on those metrics will create a greater work situation than you are right now, then it totally changes the game. It's a very, very different from a team saying, yeah, we want to move somewhat up in this direction and we want to work with this topic, and suddenly you have a clear direction saying, okay, so right now, during an entire week or a day, we had one team member had one period of three hours of uninterrupted work where they didn't get uh, changing priorities from external parties where they didn't, weren't interrupted by meetings. We want to get that number to a higher level, and we're going to measure it on a day-to-day -day basis. Are we able to deliver that on that? It's, a to it's like playing football. So you're practicing, scoring a bit of goals on each side of the cor court, and then suddenly it's a real game. So now you're starting to count those goals, and people are suddenly playing in a very, very different way. But then the question became, so we want this, but how do we do that in an agile context? We can't stand there with a clock just watching people do user stories and then time them. Okay, how much time did that take? That's going to be ridiculous. So how do we get the data to find out where are we coming from and where do we want to go? How can we make this realistically ambitious goal? And we found that there are two key elements in doing this. One of them is looking at historic data. And it's actually it's not so, so difficult. Use the last three weeks of whatever you delivered, look at those work items, look at them, how many fulfilled different criteria you're working on. Just do the rough thing, because we're using the 80-20 principle as well. We're using 20% of the effort and trying to get 80% of the benefit. And as long as we don't have to be very specific, then we can do a very, very good rough estimate. Where are we coming from? Where do we want to go? We had a team. It took them 20 minutes to find out that around... 75% of whatever they were doing, uh, or whatever defects they were fixing, were recurrent defects. So they were fixing the same defects over and over and over and over again because they were do just doing the short-term problem fix, uh, getting the user to be able to continue using the system, but they didn't solve the root cause right. That seems like something we want to fix because if we can eliminate those 75%, then we can get to a state where we can use much more of our energy on the real exciting work of doing new product development. Quite surprisingly, because we thought, oh my god, using value stream mapping in an agile context, people are just going to think this is way too much process. But actually, just doing a rough map, what we call that, if you're familiar with Kanban, we call those knowledge discovery activities, because we're not trying to make software into a sequential process. Uh, but the overall steps that our work is going through, what happens there? What is actually the purpose of identifying the user needs? What, why do we talk to users at this point? How automated is our deployment, that gives a real good understanding of what we're working with right now. And matching those against the future desirable capabilities that we want to strive towards often makes it very easy to come up with some brilliant goals and the entire team organization is really... If we can move ourselves to this state, it's going to be so much more fun going to work uh, compared to what it is right now. So just doing those rough value stream maps not like the lean manufacturing stuff where you'll spend 14 days trying to find out the workflow of each individual work item. Oh my god, a large user story is probably slightly different from the small user story. That's not the level of abstraction we're talking about. Great. And once we get there, we want to acknowledge that it is an iterative exercise. We will face lots of obstacles in trying to deliver on these improvement goals. And it's so funny that we kind of... And from the Agile community side, we've been telling the rest of the world for like decades now, product development is not a straight road from A to B. So you should prepare to be iterative, face obstacles. And then again and again, we set unrealistic smart goals. And once we face the fact that they're not a straight road from A to B, we give up. And then at the next retrospective session, we'll now evaluate why we weren't able to deliver on that goal. Because we assumed when we went into that sprint or whatever, that it was a straight road from A to B, which is not. Because things happen. So 
the people that we wanted to invite for this great workshop, they declined the meeting, or John got sick, or uh, the tool did not work on our platform, or whatever can happen. And if it's going to take us two weeks to evaluate on that constraint before we can plan our next step, that's going to be very little improvement we can do in that period of time. But to do that, we need to make improvement part of our daily work. So that means taking very, very small steps and teaching our brain that it's okay to cope with this stress because all improvement is stressing your brain in some sense. And we're doing this by asking the very simple questions. Okay, for this next experiment you're going to do, what are you going to do? What do you expect? Once we've executed it, what happened? What did we learn from it? And then we're ready to take the next step, maybe even just the day after. And to do that, we need to start thinking in shorter smaller increments. So it seems that Henrik would be the ideal guy to do this, but he won't be here. So what if Carl could do it instead? Yeah, if we want to include ev all five people, then it's going to be something we can do two weeks from now, but maybe we can do it with three people already tomorrow. Could we call them? Instead of writing an email, waiting two days for them to get back to us, could we just call them right now to see if they would even possibly want to engage with us in working this specific way? And that's very difficult because it seems that when we're teaching this stuff, uh, people are so pre-programmed in thinking in two or three weeks iterations that they don't even consider the fact that they should do exactly the same as they're doing with their user stories, trying to bring things down into small increment, taking smaller learning steps towards the desirable future state. It's really about teaching organizations, teams, managers, to be what we call response-able. And there's a great book called The Responsibility Process. I would definitely suggest that you read that. But it's really about do not always just hand it over to somebody else. It's like we've been teaching organizations. Yeah, whenever you face a problem, escalate. Great, something great is going to happen, except nobody's going to do anything about that. Because suddenly there are 15 escalated problems, and no, the manager, he still cannot provide any test environments because he's not a technical guy. So... At the very least, if you do not have the budget mandate or if you don't have the decision mandate, don't escalate, facilitate. So it might be that you do not have the mandate to do it, but then you want to be the one facilitating the process of getting that decision done instead of just escalating it to a level where nothing happens. But that's difficult. That's where we need to teach organizations to work in a different way. Okay. So we have two cutters. Uh, the first one is called the improvement cutter. It sounds a bit lean abstract, but it's really just a process. Understand where you're going, grasp where you are right now, plan the next step you want to be in in four weeks, and then work iteratively to try to reach that step. And again, we have metrics on this stuff, so it's not so difficult. It's not some abstract exercise. It's just about setting realistically ambitious goals and then iteratively working towards it in that direction. This is going to be very strange for some people in the agile world, but at Toyota, it's a core principle that managers are directly involved in coaching teams in process improvement. So that means that you might in a manufacturing context be able to do this twice a day. We can't really do that because even hard as we try, it's very difficult to do experiments that we can already execute and validate just in the morning. But we can do this one or two times a week. And this provides two great potential. It provides the potential for the manager to actually get an insight into what is keeping my team from reaching their full potential. Why can't they get there? How might I support them? And then a surprising other factor was the fact that somebody is paying attention. In the beginning, we have some coaching catcher questions, which makes it possible for the manager to evaluate what step are they taking, are they mature, what can they do better, how can I guide them in that direction. But really, in the beginning, it's, pro it's very mechanical. But even in the beginning, teams really appreciated this because somebody was taking an active interest. What is troubling you guys? What are you doing to take the next step? Why can't you take that step? Why did you get blocked? What can we do to solve that problem? Yeah, so we cheated a bit. And uh, we made this look like something that was familiar. So we put this into this known scrum circle so that people would have something to relate to. Uh, so we plan the next target condition, meeting of 90 minutes, should be one step closer to our challenge. And we do these coaching catches two times a week to make sure that there's a feedback loop constantly going on. How are we doing in moving closer to this direction? 
Then we had to introduce a team kata, and it's not a part of the original framework. But that's simply the process of looking every day at our experiments, are they progressing? So, okay, Henrik got sick. Carl, can you do that instead? Great. Perfect. Let's move one step closer. Or Carl obviously should pull that decision and not being told by somebody else. Uh, so, can we make this a continuous exercise? And it might be that the daily kata is just a one-minute meeting because, no, we cannot evaluate this experiment before tomorrow. Great. But at least let's follow up tomorrow because there's a date on that specific experiment saying, when can we follow up to see if it was a success? And there's something fun going on here. Because I don't know if, how many have been part, uh, part of a leadership workshop. Now you should all learn in two hour sessions to set to be a, a true modern leader. How many have been part of a trust workshop? Now you should learn to trust each other. Okay. Those workshops are great, but they're only great if you're delivering on the core capabilities of the organization to use those principles. So let's say that you have an organization. There is no delegation of responsibility. All your technical frameworks and platforms are incredibly fragile, so whenever you try to do an experiment, you're just punished for moving just slightly out of line. Is that going to be an environment that's very supportive of trust? Because every time you have to make a decision, you have to go all the way up the hierarchy, all the way down again to find out whether you can actually make that decision. And every time you try to release an MVP or MVF, you don't really have the technical environment to do so, so you end up not doing it. So all those workshops, they're not going to be worth a lot of money because you don't have the core capabilities in place to actually use them. So you cannot just go tell people, trust each other from tomorrow, be a great leader. You have to deliver on the core capabilities of the organization to use that. And then you might have the trust workshop or leadership workshop. Another thing we found that if we want to measure improvement, then we need to make teams, managers, organizations aware of the difference between what we call leading and lagging indicators. So leading indicators are the process improvement work that we're doing focused on the process. No customer ever asked for automated test frameworks. No customer ever asked for one-by-one -one flow. No customer ever asked for visual transparent management. They, totally, they do not care, guys. We might pretend that they care, but they don't. But those are the things that we can actually deliver on. Those are the leading indicators. Those I can affect today. What I cannot affect today is, I want throughput to go through the roof. What if we can deliver 500 more user stories a year? That would be great, right? But that's not something I can... I cannot do something today, and then I'll see immediately, okay, did we deliver more? Those are the lagging indicators. From doing the process right, we'll get the results that we want. But the process is what we can influence now, and then we have a strong assumption that it's going to turn into results on the business outcomes that we want as well. And that's a different mindset. And it's not that we don't like outcome. We love outcome. We would all love to deliver better quality, shorter cycle time, higher throughput, more predictability, more stable environments, all that stuff that our customers appreciate. We would dearly love that. But the problem is that they're all lagging. We cannot influence them directly. And if we try to do so, we might do some very, very short-term optimization to try to just reach a number. But it's not going to be stable for the long run. It's much the same with a car. Okay, so you want to decrease the fertility rate of driving a car. Great. How do I do that right now, today? Probably you don't do that by measuring the fertility rates of cars uh, going up and down. Probably you do that by installing some security equipment in your car. And then you have a strong assumption that if we can make the individual car safer by installing another airbag, then that will turn out into a drop in fertility rate, which is what we actually want. Okay, so this is probably the simplest we've ever seen compared with the most powerful we've ever seen. And it's just to state that this does not have to be rocket science. It can be very, very simple stuff. So this team, the organization, the entire organization, were moving towards using Toyota Kata. As every other team, they'd been invited, and at the point in time, they thought this would be a great idea. But the problem is that they were incredibly stressed. So as we were approaching the startup workshop, uh, they were saying, okay, could we not do that? Uh, maybe we could plan it for in a month or something, because we have all these things that we need to deliver right now, and there's too much operation and maintenance going on, we cannot deal with it. 
uh, their process lead or scrum master in this case said, no, we need to do this, guys, because otherwise we won't survive in the long run as a, as a team. But they were really not committed. Like, they were the guys showing up, can we get out of this room as soon as possible so we can go back to our daily work, right? Because they had so much stuff going on. It was all a mix of different things. Managers coming in, okay, do this, guys. It's so important. Just got a call from this customer. Uh, ticket systems telling them that things were off the chart. Walk-ins coming into the room saying, oh, could you fix this for me right now? Really what we want to typically avoid in, a, in an agile setup, right? So we went through the core capabilities. And a sudden change happened in the room. Because suddenly they were looking towards this desirable future state. And rarely have I seen a team come to a conclusion so fast in terms of where they wanted to be. Because they immediately pointed to the visual management stuff, said, if we could get one place where we could see planned work, the priority of that planned work, and what we're actually working on, that would be great. If we could then also get a pull system in place so that once we finish stuff, that is at the point in time where we'll consider whether to pull in new stuff. Because that would make this constant change of priorities, working on 10 different things at the same time, that would be very valuable to us. And doing their rough value stream map, it was pretty clear that they were not there yet, right? Uh, it was actually the case that if you should look for the next highest plant work item, you had to go to sef seven different places. Seven different places to find out, as a single team member, what am I going to work on next? Does that mean there's a clear priority? Probably not. Are they going to work on the most important stuff? Probably not. If you then had to go look for what, what they had started, then you had to go look in five places. And yes, they had both a scrum board and a Kanban board. Isn't that great? So even the board was not in one place. So they set themselves some very, very pragmatic goals. We want to go from seven to one place to see priority of work. We want to go from five to one place. We want to have go from 32 items in progress to an average of nine. That would be great. And they actually delivered on that. And the result was that the velocity went from six to 11. And it actually increased further. And it's not that velocity is this great metric that you can also trust. It's just they were not trying to improve. They were trying to deliver on these core capabilities. And they, they just used the velocity metric as a proof of validation. OK, did we do this stuff right? So they're not hunting the velocity metric, because that you can easily game that. Anyone can double their velocity from one day to so just change the uh, baseline of your story point estimation or whatever you're, you're using. right? So that was very simple. And if you think that's what, that was easy and they should have done that years ago, First of all, it wasn't easy. And they'd been considering this for almost two years and nothing had happened, right? And it took them serious work because they had to train their customers to use the right input channels. They had to train themselves to get rid of old habits in terms of firefighting stuff that shouldn't be firefighted and all that stuff. But they got there and then achieved great results. And at the end of their first challenge here, they came back and said, okay, I know we used a lot of time for coaching and training and kind of stuff. Even if we just stopped right now, it would so much have been worth it. We've been talking about this for a month. Nothing happened. Suddenly, there were these clear improvement goals. And we did a lot of experiments that failed. But we were able to take those small steps in that direction. One of the other aspects of CATA is that we use these improvement boards. Very visual. This board is one meter tall, 1.7 meter wide. In the team room, visual for everybody to see. This is part of the the way of pushing against this daily whirlwind. And we don't have time to go through all the details of this improvement border, but it's pretty much just set up. This is our challenge. This is our target. This is where we, we are right now. These are the obstacles that we're facing trying to get to this direction. And these are the experiments and the results of those experiments that we are in, in progress right now. Okay. And the funny thing is that the obstacle part is here in the, born, in the corner. And it's perfectly true. When they say that all problems should not be solved, it's perfectly true. If a team will put six obstacles up there, on average, they'll solve one or two, and they'll be at the place where they want to be. So it's just our brain is pre-wired to find all sorts of obstacles that we should fix, but they're really not important. So people are teams, managers, organizations, they are consecutively reaching their goals without solving all the problems they thought they needed to solve to try to get there. I think that's a very, very important learning point.
And then there's this thing about management. What should an agile manager do? Well, there are a few things that I think an agile manager should do. They should set a direction, a strategic direction, and then they should stay away from the tactical and operational responsibility of delivering that direction. But they should be able to point clearly to where are we doing now to help this company achieve its strategic goals. That one. They should do people management. They should make sure that people can actually grow in this organization so that they'll stay there and we won't have high employee churn. And then they should do process improvement. Because there are so many of the improvement potential that, are not, that cannot be done at the team level. There are so many constraints in terms of funding processes, in terms of governance, in terms of how we're allocated to different teams, how we incentivize people, all that stuff. If we do not have a management focus on improvement, those things are going to stay the same and they're going to drastically reduce the capability of the team level to improve. So at Toyota, they don't distinguish between managing and improving. It's one and the same. And there's 0% chance of advancing in Toyota, if you haven't proven the ability to make sure that your employees, your teams can show up for work happier and be able to be more productive. That is what your job as a manager is. It's not that you should take over from the technical stuff going on to you, but you should make sure that on an organizational level, you're providing the best possible environment for people and teams to flourish. And you should be able to measure, because your boss is going to ask you once a week, what are you doing to improve your department, your area, your business unit. So imagine your organization when all managers are focusing on goals like how can we get, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, that was the right slide. Uh, how can we delegate more responsibility safely to the team level? How can we increase the number of end-to-end -end teams so we don't have all these handovers going on? And we don't, maybe we don't even need SAFE anymore because we were so good at doing a value stream product-facing organization that all the coordination that we thought we had to solve, all the problems, they were gone because suddenly we're doing things from a real agile perspective and not trying to use SAFE for, for everything. I had a oh, just remembering a story. There was one organization they were tracking the success of their agile transition by the number of release trains they were implementing. So they were tracking their agile transition based on how many times they'd given up. Isn't that crazy? So every time we scale agile, that's because we gave up. We tried to be as creative as we possibly could, but we could not get to the point where we didn't need a lot of team working towards the same goal and with lots of dependencies in between them. So we gave up, and now we're starting to track our success based on how many times we gave up. That's crazy. So imagine an organization where all managers have measurable improvement targets to create the environment to be as agile as we possibly can and reduce all that overhead that we're trying to, to get away from. Okay, so was it easy to find out how we can develop this Agile starter kata? And what I probably forgot to mention, to be clear enough in the beginning, what I've presented here are just some of the rough things, but it's a starter kata. It's what we begin with to train and learn ourselves to think from a scientific perspective, to do small measurable improvement, to have a shared direction, but it's just a starter kata. And that means that we actually expect it, that once you've got these things in place, then you will start to adapt and adjust and find another way of doing it that will better be suited to your organization. But was it easy? No. So we had to find out, okay, leading versus lagging, that's a drastically different concept in an agile concept. Uh, we scaled too quickly because we got some initial great results, but it turned out some of those were false positives. Oh, damn. False positives are really, really dangerous when you're suddenly scaling this into 20 teams at, and four departments at the same time, right? Uh, some were not change ready, so they had already, they had a great deadline coming up and working. Yeah, it shouldn't be like that in agile context, right? But they've been working six months towards this deadline. Now suddenly they're starting to participate in CATA training two weeks before they are about to deliver. Not a good place. Coaching capacity, uh, too much team level focus. We made lots and lots of mistakes, but we got to the point where we could safely introduce CATA uh, and have about an 80% success of, uh, of doing so. Okay, so I got the chance to work with Carter in 2012 in a single team, got the chance to use it as part of doing larger ag agile transitions, and then I got, to use, got the chance to use it as an uh, organizational-wide initiative here in 2017 towards 2018. So that's taught me a lot, and I tried to put all those words into a, a book, so actually that's what I've been doing for the last... Months. If you want to be notified when this book is out, 
I really hope that I'm going to get it on Lean Pub within the next month. Uh, but there are things outside your control. And I should take responsibility for that, I know. Uh, I'm doing everything I can to have my brother deliver that forward for me. I even wrote a draft forward for him so that he would just have to make the adjustments. I'm doing everything I can, but I still need him. Uh, I also need Henrik Niebeck to get back to me with his version of the forward. Uh, and again, those are busy people, so it's, uh, it's not easy. Yeah. Uh, we found out that some of the more mature teams, they got a bit tired of updating the physical board. Because, yeah, you do sometimes have to either draw the trend lines on a piece of paper or you need to uh, print it out from Excel or whatever you're trying to do. Uh, so we we've created a product called Chica. TK, right, Toyota Kata, funny. Uh, and if you, it will be opening for early adopters soon. You should not start Kata if you do not have to in an electronic system. It's much the same with Scrum. Keep it visual, keep it physical. But if you're distributed, you might have to. And once you get the hang of it, then there's, a, there's some, probably some benefit in having it easier uh, to update in an electronic tool. Okay. So that was uh, what I had brought today. So we have a bit of uh, time left. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. <laughs>